welcome back to another episode of Debatable with your hosts, Nina and Kyle. I'm Nina. I'm Kyle. And today, we are joined by Mary Valiente, who is our motion contributor for Debatable Open 2022's Feminist Emotion Set. Mm. So, hello. Hi, Mary. Hi. Thank you for having me. Happy to be here. And thank you as well for joining us. So, before we begin with this episode and for this PDA, we kind of want to ask you to tell us about yourself and why you particularly like feminist emotions. Okay. Um, so, about myself, by profession, I've been a full-time debate coach for middle school and high school debaters. And, you know, I used to debate for UPLB, although I've successfully retired from that. Mm-hmm. Um, in terms of my interest in feminist emotions, I'm not an academic feminist, although I am really interested. I'm actually planning on studying that for postgrad at some point. But I've been passionate about feminism, mainly due to certain struggles that I think are common, unfortunately, among all women. So like throughout my early and adult life, like for example, experiences on being sexually abused as, you know, as a child, as opposed to, as a supposed friend, as an employee, um, which again is sadly a common experience. And I think that growing up, honestly, it wasn't really something that my immediate circles really talked about all too often. And I really felt like there was a severe lack of systems and mechanisms to protect me um, and help me out. So I just really wanted to be as vocal as as I comfortably can about it. And I think that um, that really also translates to some of the things that I do at work. For example, like I make sure that I talk about feminism and address uh, like problematic language and behaviors in my classes with really young students. Um, So yeah, I'm just really all about putting the feminist agenda everywhere out there, have people talk about it and hear women's stories so that um, girls don't grow up the way that I did. Yeah, so what's difficult, I think, about debating about feminism is you have to be very sensitive about it because a lot of these experiences Mm -hmm. are, as you said, very, um, unfortunately, very common, even among debaters who might be in the room. So what do you think most debaters actually get wrong when they're tackling feminist emotions? And what advice Mm -hmm. do people who end up struggling with this theme? Mm -hmm. You know, I think that lately, at least in PDU, I'm not sure elsewhere, there's been great improvement in terms of like equity policies and people are really much more careful about their language. I think that with regards to that, I'm not really, um, I don't think that there's still a huge and alarming um, lack of respect for people inside the community with regards to the language that they use about women. Um, But I think that the bigger problem is how seriously feminist motions are taken. Like, you know how most people would hate encountering IR and econ motions because they're matter heavy. And then they feel relieved when they get gender or feminist emotions because they they feel like they can wing those types of debates. Um, And like also at least during my time, I'm not sure now, like Adjkor wouldn't really assign feminist emotions in break rounds as much because they're they're supposedly easier. So as an adult, I started trying to read more about feminism, like books, um, and I immediately regretted not doing that earlier because I realized how limited my perspective was. And I think that this also reflects in debating. Um, like most debaters, I think, have a background of privilege like relatively have backgrounds of privilege, that means that we are also prone to making arguments that are also privileged. So for example, I think that, um, Anuba, I think that a lot of debaters don't know how to illustrate, let's say, uh, the harms of austerity and other neoliberal practices from um, organizations like IMF or World Bank on women, because these are not necessarily real- realities that we ourselves experience. Um, But it's important to know about them so that we can further characterize them during debates. So I think that the common misconception is that knowing like just current events like uh, as they pop up on social media is enough, um, but it's not. So I think that people don't really take it as seriously as they do IR and Econ motions in terms of how well they matter load on these things. So I really highly suggest um, reading books, especially on like radical feminist books. Because I do think that we we tend to have a liberal bias. And it's not, I think that I can't blame people that much because majority of the accessible literature on feminism that really do have a liberal bias. So I think that debaters have um, to actively seek out literature that are not just like coming from the West, like seek literature coming from women of color, for example, or even Filipino feminist books and literature um, so that they can talk deeper about these things and not be limited by their own like just narrow perspectives. So yeah. Yeah, that I feel like is one of the main difficulties especially when I was back like competitively debating. Not that Mm -hmm. I'm retired, you know, but you know... (laughs) 
trying to retire. Um, it, it's the difficulty of accessing the correct way of viewing things or different perspectives. So I guess one of our main initiatives with this episode as well, and the rest of our post-debate analyses is to give people opportunities to look into the motions and understand them more, especially from a perspective of someone who crafted these ideas and has probably read a lot to be able to create these motions in the first place. So I guess this brings us to the first topic, um, which Kyle and I, when we saw it, honestly, we, we really, really liked because we were kind of impressed, not, not impressed, but we were amazed at the mixture of the different themes here. So this house regrets the default classification of women as a vulnerable sector in international policy frameworks on gender and conflict. So we really like this motion and I had a lot of questions in mind. And I guess Mm -hmm. the first one I want to ask is, what are the origins of this classification and why were women deemed as vulnerable in the first place? Mm -hmm. Um, So I think that most international policy frameworks on gender and conflict actually use um, like the male perpetrator and female victim paradigm. Like whenever I read like frameworks or even just statements coming from different organizations like the UN, for example, they always use the male perpetrator versus female victim like voice. When talking about gender violence, for example, they often only talk about women because by default they consider them to be victims. So like even not just in international um, like fields, even in I guess local frameworks, when we talk about um, gender and violence against certain genders, one of the first things that come to mind is violence against women. So for example, let's talk IR because this motion is IR. So for example, in the Fourth Geneva Convention, it says female civilians in an occupied territory must be protected against any attack on their honor, including rape, enforced prostitution, or any form of indecent assault. And you're not going to find any other like gender or sex within that statement. It's specifically talking about female victims. So whenever these types of things are talked about, frameworks really zero in on women as the vulnerable sector to protect, even if you know these are things that are not exclusively experienced by women anyway. Yeah, so you mentioned that it's, it is about IR, um, and in particular, it's about international policy frameworks. So yeah. I was wondering, what is the nuance between like the, that classification and international policy frameworks? Like, How do they really interact with each other? How do you imagine mm-hmm. the, focusing on this particular area of IR? Um, so inter- International frameworks like the Geneva Conventions and uh, the UNSC frameworks on gender and conflict, they have huge influence on how the international community and different NGOs formulate ways to help conflict and post-conflict zones. And also on the local level, when organizations do begin to help out and facilitate peace building, when they talk with local communities in different sectors, these frameworks have um, lasting effects on gender equality. And also like these organizations usually have the biggest uh, like reach and have the biggest capability to um, talk to different sectors like different LGUs and have the money to actually send people to help out when like doing peace building in these different zones. So we have to really consider the amount of influence that they have and the, uh, the amount of influence that they, their frameworks have. So I kind of want the debate to include discussions about what kind of help different organizations should extend to women as affected by these frameworks and what roles women can or cannot assume if they're always labeled as victims. I just feel like there are so many things that are being highlighted or erased depending on which side of the debate you're trying to defend. So I guess the next question is, when you mentioned that there's different treatment based on classification and different frameworks being used, I wanted to ask about the particulars. So if you are classified as a vulnerable sector, especially women in this case, how are they treated differently? What specifically do they get uh, different? Um, like Whether those are things are good or bad? Like I, I guess I, what I want is a better picture, especially for those who might not be familiar with how mm-hmm. these frameworks and international organizations work within these frameworks. So when you say classified as a vulnerable sector, this means that um, you're usually lumped with children, and persons with disability, a lot of times you're seen as a passive receiver of action because of um, well, a cert- a, like an assumption of a certain lack of capabilities. So I think number one, like you asked about how this changes treatment. I think that these frameworks enforce stereotypes on what men and women's roles are. 
um, like I said, they always use the voice or like the paradigm that says males are perpetrators and, wi- uh, and women are victims. That's problematic because it translates to how women are treated even after war. Because the discourse about women focuses too much on their victimhood and their passiveness in war. They're also less likely to be um, included in conflict pre- prevention or peace building because they're not seen as capable enough to do that. Like their role is being the victim. So number two, this type of identity Identity stereotyping also reduces the ability of frameworks to recognize the struggles of men um, and other gender minorities. So whenever we look at women as the default, default victims, a lot of times this um, draws attention away from other individuals who experience the same type um, of, of violence or of abuse. Also international courts. And I think um, there also has to be a shift in the way we discuss about this. As debaters, um, we should also follow the idea that women are capable of doing things as much as men are. Like, we know that. But the way we debate about it sometimes still hides certain things that women do. Like, for example... Um, international courts and military trials, they often ignore or downplay women's acts of violence. There is an erasure of the active roles that women also take during conflict. And that includes women who also take part in like perpetuating abuse. Um, So like one example that I read about is in the Nuremberg trials. Like many Nazi women escaped trial and punishment, even if they did active roles in um, like during the Holocaust. Because prosecutors just focused on like male high-level Nazi leaders, they exempted those in roles commonly held by women, like secretaries and clerks, mostly because they always see women as unable to do like or uh, participate in active roles during conflicts. And even more recently, the United Nations um, international tribunals that invested investigated Rwanda, for example, during the 1990s, they didn't really bring any woman to justice. Or at least, I'm not sure if they didn't bring any woman to justice, but really very few compared to the men who were brought to justice. So I think that we also need to talk about this because it's going to have to change. Like if we want to create certain, let's say, policies that want to prevent conflict, we can't keep ignoring what women's roles are in the perpetuation of those conflicts. Um, and also, if we keep looking at women as passive, that also creates a stereotype that um, that incapacity will translate to other areas, such as um, when the conflict is over and we have to do peace building, um, we are less likely to involve them if we see them as incapable. So I think that that's what the dif- those are the different effects that are possible um, because of these frameworks. So I guess now my question would be, on government especially, what would the alternative be? Because um, I do understand that a lot of what you're saying is, is probably is totally correct. Um, but it seems so contrary to the already established norm, especially in um, international human rights law, where you th- have this idea that um, women are almost always the, the victims of violence, stuff like that. So mm-hmm. it seems to me um, sort of difficult to imagine a world where we, we sort of give up on that or not give up on that maybe like substitute it for something else especially because mm-hmm. I think it's very entrenched like we have this entire um, human rights law instrument uh, which we call the convention on the elimination of all forms of discrimination against women and the international human rights tribunal the commission on the elimination of discrimination against women said that you don't necessarily see um, violence against women being perpetrated because of their sex but if you see a country that has a lot of violence and it just so happens that it is directed towards women we mm-hmm. actually call that discrimination so it seems like it's sort of entrenched already in the international human rights law system so what would you argue to be the alternative here especially for government mm. I totally get that this seems like I feel like this seems like a scary emotion for gov like they're going to defend, oh, we don't want to call women as victims anymore, and that might like be difficult to defend. But I don't necessarily think that it has to be that way. So um, there is what you call a gender relational approach to gender analysis, like when you create frameworks. A gender relational approach focuses on how gender roles and relations work in every particular context. So this means that it enables a sharper focus on groups of people, not necessarily just women who are particularly vulnerable. So we're going to argue that vulnerability is not dependent on sex. This allows policies and interventions to be more targeted. 
So for example, instead of classifying women as the victims, we classify certain groups of people per context as vulnerable, like um, the vulnerability of men, as well as sexual and gender minorities. They're also more likely to be looked at because right now they're often overlooked by frameworks that assume that vulnerability is associated with women and children. So what that would look like is we look at vulnerable people in general, like for a certain place that might be, let's say, rural widowed women, but it can also include lower class urban men. Um, so we don't necessarily have to say that women are never victims. We're just saying that when we narrate who the victims are, it's not dependent on whether they're a man or a woman, but it's going to depend on the context of each place that we're talking about. So you mentioned a bunch of arguments already for government in terms of the stereotyping, in terms of how it leaves other vulnerable vulnerable groups out, such as maybe men in certain contexts. So I want to ask now for opposition. How would you defend a framework like this? Like, what is the necessity of still viewing women as vulnerable, um, especially in a context that might be progressive? Because I can imagine government setting this up by talking about like the world liberalizing, how other countries are now moving forward towards their equality. So it seems that there is a way to push opposition to such a difficult corner. So I wanted to ask if you were in that position, how would you run this? Um, I think that whether it's a more conservative or liberal place, generally we can all agree that there are still a lot of gains that have to be made when it comes to gender equality and women's rights. So I would say that removing that classification may risk the gains for women being lost even before they've been consolidated. So I'm going to say that it was necessary for that classification to have existed because women and their struggles have been invisibilized for the longest time. Um, And even when we talk about, let's say, historical wars, our books often just talked about soldiers, like male soldiers and states in general, but not the vast number of women who have suffered and still continue to suffer from the effects of that to this day. So one of the strengths of the approach of um, labeling women as victims in these frameworks is that it is a necessary counterpoint to the generic male point of view when it comes to talking about conflicts, because this is what dominates traditional conflict and security discourse. Like we mostly just talk about um, what men do, what their plans are, what happens because of the actions of men and the struggles of women and the abuses against them are almost not mentioned at all in history books. So there is still so much erasure of women and their struggles during conflict and war. So many perpetrators of sexual violence against women have not been brought to justice. And even experts until today, even the ones who have recommended a gender relational approach, they still do agree that of the vast majority of individuals who experience these types of violence are women, although men victims, male victims do still exist. Um, so the value for opposition is that there's still so much that we are trying to gain Um, And we would not have gotten to a point where we are able to talk about women this way and we are able to see their struggles, if not for that classification. So I guess the world that Op needs to picture paint is that without this classification as a victim, it is easier to continuously ignore uh, women's struggles. For me, um, what makes this motion very interesting is that I had always thought that we'd move past the idea, especially in um, progressive circles. I, I always thought that we already moved past old ideas like chivalry, which of course, uh, referred to the duty of medieval knights to protect the weak, which as a default included women. I thought we'd move past that. Um, and it just boggles my mind how I failed to see uh, in my studies of international human rights law, especially with regard to women, that we are by default still treating them as weak and um, like not in complete control or have agency in their own lives, um, which I think might be a good transition to the next motion in the set, which is about challenging that um, that distinction, the idea that women are supposed to be weak, that there are certain characteristics that are conventionally feminine versus conventionally masculine. So the second mm-hmm. question is, this House believes that it's the it's in the interest of Philippine female political candidates to portray themselves as conventionally masculine. I think this, since this motion is about female political candidates, what nuanced experiences would they face in the Philippines that would probably merit the existence of this conversation, especially now? Mm-hmm. So, well, the reason why I did want to say i initially actually just wrote this motion in general like any female political candidate has this interest but i did think na since election season dinaman and i think that there is there are particular candidates who are experiencing struggles right now because of misogyny then i think it's relevant to set it up in in the philippines i think that right now um we have certain 
female candidates, most prominently um, VP Lenny running for presidency, um, who faces criticism by a lot of people coming from different political spectrums, be- just by virtue of being a female and just by virtue of exhibiting conventionally female characteristics, like portraying herself as the nanai, which is like um, antithetical to Duterte's being like the tatay, the father, the siga father figure of the Philippines. Um, there are many individuals who tell um, female candidates and who speak up about how female candidates are incapable of holding high government positions because of conventionally feminine traits such as, um, you know, being more emotional um, or being more in tune with um, empathy towards individuals being soft on criminality because of said empathy. So I feel like a lot of the criticisms against really competent female candidates are just on the basis of them being women and exhibiting uh, conventionally female characteristics. What I wanted to ask now is the portrayal of themselves as conventionally masculine. And I wanted to ask how this looks like, especially in the Philippine context. Like, Is our version of masculinity different elsewhere? Um, are they all the same? Is mm-hmm. it like acting like Duterte? Like, what do you imagine teams running as their version of masculinity? Yeah, I actually do think that um, I predict that majority of the people in this debate will probably characterize this as like Duterte-like characteristics. But it could be a vast area of things. Like, um, conventionally, we would talk about women to be or men to be less nurturing or and more iron-fisted, and this could translate to um, their language, the language that they use they tend to be more crass let's say um, they tend to be more candid it also translates to the way they aesthetically present themselves like the way that they dress um, showing no emotions I think is also conventionally considered to be male so instead of like showing um, a lot of emotions and uh, emotional language when during the campaign that's something that you would have to erase if you are portraying yourself as conventionally masculine um there's also an example for um if uh who was that margaret thatcher um she said that she actually took voice lessons in order to like lower her her voice to make it more commanding and sound more like a man because apparently that's something that um people like like people would vote for her more if she sounded more masculine It could also, it's not, it might also not just be about like the superficial things such as dress and language. It could also be about what are the issues that they talk about. So we can also say that portraying yourself as more masculine might be you excluding like the womanly aspects of life in leadership, like you talking about family. Uh, and, and your role as a mother, like you er- erase that in the con- from the conversation, could also be talking less about conventionally feminine issues such as uh, gender and environment policies and focusing more on criminality and military policies when you speak up about your campaign. So it's not just like I'm going to talk about certain things less or it's not like it's not just I'm going to lower the register of my voice. It's also like certain topics are conventionally seen as more masculine than others uh, which I think is very interesting. But I guess the next part of like prepping this debate would be what would the strategy be or what would the goal be? Because I imagine um, that most debates like this would be something like on one hand government teams or some teams would say that it will make the female political candidates more likely to win but they're going to have a harder time breaking down like mm-hmm. certain stereotypes in the future so I, I guess my question is for each team what would the goal of each side be? Um, I think that in general it's more than just I think that the first goal is obviously getting a woman into government positions I think both sides would agree that this is um, a value but the second thing as well is being able to forward women's agenda like the different issues that uh, women face and only women can or at least the most competent individuals who can talk about women's issues are women themselves Um, So I think that the goal of each side would be to have women's agenda pushed further um, in in governments. And I think that it's going to be, it doesn't have to be different goals for government and opposition. Although I do think that for opposition side, it's important for them to say that um, even if we do not win, why is it more harmful if a candidate who acts like this is going to make it more difficult to achieve the goal of forwarding women's agenda? Because if it includes like not talking too much about conventionally female feminine issues such as gender, for example, or family, 
um, then that would mean that it's also hard to talk about that when once you are elected. It's also hard to maintain um, your base, your like your clout. I would say if you start focusing more on these things. So it's kind of like opposition would say, they got into position as women, but are they really forwarding women's agenda after all? So given that those are the trade-offs for each side, I wanted to ask how you would basically allow one team to have an edge over another. So for government side, how would you argue that they achieved their goals better of being able to get women in power, but also have them, for example, um, achieve the goal of breaking stereotypes stereotypes and whatnot. So I would argue, if I were on government side, I would first argue the significance of being in power in the first place and why there is still more likelihood of women in general, not just them, but women in general, being able to push forward their agenda. So even assuming the worst case scenario of um, like as president, because you're portraying yourself as masculine, you won't be able to forward women's agenda more. There is still an effect on in terms of representation. Like for example, when people see that the leader is female, it's going to open doors, not just in the present, but also in the future for uh, the likelihood that another female president is going to get elected. So it's about normalization as well. Um, of females in positions of females in positions of power, um, and again, an emphasis on what a president can do in terms of um, influencing decisions or influencing policies. It doesn't have to be um, them always trying to portray themselves as masculine all throughout. Um, there will always be opportunities for these individuals to still forward women's agenda when they are in power, comparatively or I mean compared to when they're not in positions of power, it doesn't have to be big like gestures. It could be small actions. Uh, it could be as small as being able to include more women inside the cabinet or being able to include more, appoint more individuals, um, women individuals in, in government positions as well. So I think that all of these interests can still happen. It doesn't all have to be perfect now, but we are setting up a timeline where women are more generally viewed as acceptable in positions of power. So I guess, like, given that on, on government side, the next part of this would be how would opposition defend the use of feminine traits? Or actually, do they have to defend that female political candidates have to use feminine traits? Or, like, can it be some sort of hybrid? Or if opposition is expected to defend using feminine traits, how would you defend that to achieve those goals? I think that opposition it, yeah, you're right. It doesn't have to be just being expected to like use feminine, um, conventionally feminine characteristics to win an election. For example, oh, to win an election. Sorry, um, it could also just be these individuals just being themselves, regardless of their characteristics. It shouldn't be their selling point. Um, and I think that opposition will probably more likely argue about the genuineness of the advocacies that they are trying to fight for. It's easier for them to get support when they are, and it's easier for them to push for women's agenda um, when they are portraying themselves as authentic rather than pandering to um, what toxic ma masculinity requires of them or wants them to look like. Um, their opposition is going to talk about how um, being able to portray yourself as masculine or using that as a strategy will never will create an environment where individuals who do not act that way will never be accepted as competent individuals to be in positions of power. And at the end of the day, we don't want that to happen because then we're just creating a world that um, the only women who can be in positions of power are those who act the way that men want them to act or the way that a patriarchal society wants them to act. So in terms of inclusivity in the present and in the future, opposition can get an edge over government by saying that um, we do not promote a genuine form of in inclusivity when we mask ourselves as masculine because this creates a precedent for all other women who want to be in positions of leadership in the future. Yeah, so what I'm learning from this is that basically women don't win either way, right? So yeah. it seems that there, there is always a sacrifice women have to make. Um, whether it's in politics, whether it's in how they present themselves, whether it's in how they interact with others. 
which I guess brings us perfectly to the last motion of this set, which is about corporations paying women not to have children. So it says this house believes that corporations should pay women not to have children. Again, I think it's related because it's about women once again adjusting or fitting into a particular stereotype that men expect of them if they're working or men expect of them because they are female and they have that particular anatomy. So I kind of want to ask now in relation to this, what is the corporate culture about women and towards women who choose to be pregnant or start families? So on government, how would you frame this to be a problem that needs solving to the point that corporations need to pay? Um, so I think that it doesn't even have to be just talking about women who choose to be pregnant or women who want to start families. Because even in status quo, even if the employer has absolutely no idea about what your plans are, like they don't even know if you want children in the future, but you are still less likely to be hired and less likely to be promoted. The company is less likely to invest in you because they, by default, they think that you're going to be a liability because there's a possibility of you becoming pregnant. So it's either they don't hire you at all or they just don't invest in you as much as they would on a male candidate or on a male employee. Um, So the corporate culture right now about women is that they are seen as, like what I said, they are seen more as liabilities. Uh, and as individuals not worthy of investment. If I am on the government side, I would say that this is obviously a problem that needs solving because um, women tend to be discounted from positions. Women tend not to be accepted by companies as individuals worthy of investment just because of that possibility. If companies know that they can stop a woman from having a child or, or at least like incentivize women not to have a child, that opens doors for a company giving them more responsibility, promoting them because they know that it's sort of a, a contract that they're entering. Like you're not going to get um, pregnant in exchange for that. I'm going to give you certain rewards. Yeah, so since you mentioned that they're seen as a liability, I, I suppose like it might be useful for teams to like sort of talk about why is it that women in general tend to get paid less than men for the same work? Because mm-hmm. there are some people on, especially on the right, like people from Prager University or something like that, they say stuff like if women do get paid less, doesn't that mean that they're not a liability? Like they're cheaper to hire. So that means that employers are more likely to hire them. Um, Could you um, sort of dispel that notion for us a bit? So I read about this before and also heard, heard it on a podcast. Um, there's a lot of vagueness when it comes to the saying that women earn less than men doing the same job. Like there's this statistic that we always hear or like this figure that we always hear, like women earn 80 cents or like 70, 70, 77 cents for every dollar that a man earns. Um, so I think that what I learned was that this has a lot to do with how women's careers evolve versus how men's careers evolve. So let's take a couple, let's say, who graduated from the same university, who learned the same course, um, and they went to the same company, started on the same position. A decade from now, the man might have been promoted, but the woman is probably not going to be promoted because if they do start a family, the woman is expected to stay home. And so when a woman is expected to stay home, and this is not the fault of companies in general, this is like a whole societal problem as well. Like when the woman is expected to stay home, obviously it's impossible for them to take a lot more responsibility in that company. Um, And so that's why they don't get promoted. They don't get a raise because instead of saying, yes to let's say travel for work they're gonna say no because they have to stay at home to take care of the child so even if they had the same starting point as the man doing the same job they're still going to eventually earn less than the man can um, simply because of societal expectations that they should stay home and take care of their children yeah so when the motion says let's pay them not to have children it can be anything right it doesn't necessarily have to be like literally bribe money like hey I'm gonna I'm gonna pay you if you don't get children mm-hmm. um, so I suppose it could also be like like you said more promotions uh, more benefits etc or I'm thinking they might be given the equivalent of their paid their paid in benefits pay, yeah um so i think like on government you can say that that's what it would mean if women choose not to have children under that policy but i suppose the next question would be on opposition what alternative would be provided like will they just be stuck not being promoted or 
you know, being paid lower compared to men. Would, does opposition have to stick with status quo or can they give some sort of counter policy for the motion? I think there, are an, there is an area of counter proposals that you can give, one of which I think can be um, copied from, let's say, Scandinavian countries where paternal leaves are mandated. So if we want to address the issue that women are always getting left behind because there's an there's a societal expectation that they take care of, of children at home and that results to them not being promoted while men still continue on going on a straight path with regards to their career. If we create a counter proposal where paternal paternity leaves, sorry, but paternity leaves are mandated, then that means that um, men take care of the children as much as women do and take as much of a hit to their careers as much as women do. So I think that this is a possible uh, scenario that opposition can use to fight government with. That's interesting. I really like the fact that it's not limiting, right? I think if you're listening to this as a debater, right, it just proves that there are different policies you can employ and you're not stuck having to defend something that might be difficult for you to defend, right? So there are options, for example, like like altering the, the relationship of the company with men instead of forcing women to adapt. Um, so I guess now I want to ask about the arguments of this motion. So if you were in government, what would you use as a justification, be it principle or pragmatic, to say that this is something necessary and something that women would benefit from actively? Um, so I think that the government side would benefit greatly from painting a counterfactual. Um, so in a world where women are not paid to have children, even if, let's say, the opposition says that they're going to have paid paternity leave. So let's address that one by one, because I feel like I'm being a little too scattered here. So first, be on a counterfactual where um, in a world where women are not paid to have children, the more, most likely scenario is either they're not going to be employed by uh, companies anymore because they know that there's always a possibility of them getting pregnant and there are low incentives, at least in a society that's narrow-minded about women, there are little to no incentives for, for them to be without children. Or number two, they're not going to get um, as many promotions or as many um, like rewards coming from their companies because they have children. Um, meanwhile, if we do pay women not to have children, it's an assurance for the company. Um, if they give a big enough incentive for women, they are going to stay focused on, at, at work and not become quote-unquote liabilities to them. But the second scenario is if you're fighting against uh, an opposition um, team that talked about a counter proposal on, uh, let's say, mandated paternity leaves, how are you going to fight them then? So I think um, based on research as well, um, you are going to see that even in countries such as Finland and Sweden, where there are mandated paternity leaves, men still uh, um, tend not to go on these leaves as long as women do. So for example, you're just given, um, let's say, 12 months total, and you can um, divide that between a man and a woman. There is still expectation that the woman will take majority of that leave uh, and just, let's say, give three months or four months to a man. Um, and there are many different iterations of that. Essentially, the societal expectation on women does not change. In fact, this just makes it worse for women because then corporations are um, just going to more likely, um, they're, they're still more likely to not hire women. Um, the same problem is still going to exist. So I think for opposition, what you're going to say is that um, paying women not to have children is, number one, also going to be against their bodily autonomy, like our principle of not having vitiated consent and control on women's bodies. But secondly, um, you're going to have to argue that this, not, this does not solve the problem. Um, uh, because this same culture will still, this same policy will still perpetuate the culture of um, women and women who have children as liability. So like you're still saying that when women have children, they are liabilities rather than creating policies that uh, make like company culture more inclusive to women, women who have children. Like for example, having companies make making flexi time more possible because they realize that women and other individuals do have to take care of children, but that doesn't mean that that should take away from their um, like productivity. So yeah, that's what I envision the debate to look like. Yeah, I think it's a really rich debate. Um, I hope that people are able to dig deep and actually see those different nuances because it's not just about like the, the relationship of the woman to a corporation. It's also about what message we're sending to the rest of society as well as 
to different family units on what the responsibility should be. Um, so thank you so much for that, as well as the analysis for the three motions in total. So I guess before we end, we want to ask something kind of, for me, this is kind of personal. Um, because at the beginning of this episode, you talked about how you personally went through struggles and have an attachment to feminist motions. And I personally have that as well. And I'm sure a lot of women in the debate community still struggle about not just being here as a debater, but speaking their minds and crafting their own spaces in this circuit, especially because of all the stereotypes that exist, the limitations placed on them, even the inherent fear that they have about doing a sport that is deemed to be masculine because it's argumentative, you're speaking out against others, etc. So I guess, you know, given that you are an individual that a lot of people look up to, um, myself included, what advice would you give these women, the women who are struggling to make their space and find their voice here in the community? Um, oh, there's so much to unpack here, but uh, let me start by saying that with regards to representation in the debate community, I do think that this is not as big of a problem as it used to be. It's great to see that. I remember doing edgecore work in, I think that was Davao before or Zamboanga, I don't remember. But um, they told me when we were trying to accept um, invite or subsidized judges, they said that there's no need to prioritize female applicants because majority of the achievers in those circuits are already female anyway. And I think that that also is reflected in like even in Manila, even in um, also in the national circuit, a lot of the achievers are female. But that doesn't mean that there aren't any problems. And I do think that one of the most re recent issues that I saw personally was um, like with regards to victims of, let's say, um, assault or sexual harassment in the community, I do know that it's difficult for women to speak up and talk about it. Um, when what ha what happens in training or what happens in like competitions and tournaments themselves. Um, I think that I have two things that I want to say, both the victims and women in general in PBU. Um, so for a number one, women in general in PBU, I think we have to remember to be kind to individuals who speak up about their victimhood stories. Because I do see like in instances where people speak up about their experiences, we still tend to crucify them and even like defend the perpetrators, like question whether it's true or not. And it's so weird because we debate about this all the time, but we still find ourselves like bullying and being cruel to these individuals who speak up, no matter how annoying a person is or no matter how unlikable a person is. I do think that there has to be a moral, there's a moral imperative for us to side with the woman when they speak up. Because um, I think that right now the problem is women feel like they're going to be torn apart by people who are great at arguing uh, in the debate community once they do speak up. So number one is let's try to be kind to people who speak up. And for the victims themselves, um, I think that it's unfair for me to tell them to keep on speaking up even if it's hard. That's not what I want to tell them. But I do want to say that um, there are a lot of individuals who want to help. And I do know that there are individuals, younger individuals, who are trying to create frameworks on, like, let's say, equity policies. Um, so I highly suggest trying to reach out to individuals like women that you trust. Um, there is value in your story and there is value in the policies that can be crafted out of your, like, your experiences so that we can move forward. Um, and I'm particularly proud of young female debaters right now. I think there's a huge improvement in the way that people have been handling equity concerns, especially relating to like um, sexual violence, sexual harassment. Like we have never talked about it as much as we have now. So I think that, yeah, let's continue to be systematic about it. Let's try to find people who have an intention of creating frameworks for improving that. But yeah, generally, I, I'm just really proud of PBU for improving on that area. Yeah, so uh, actually, I was going to say that um, the zero tolerance policy on harassment, including sexual harassment, is something that the Philippine debate circuit is sort of leading the way in because um, we've had members of our equity teams and we had to explain to them that we do have a special policy that is for sexual, um, sexual assault. Mm -hmm. Um, 
so but we recognize that it's not like a perfect system yet so I think it's a good oppor- we can use this as a good opportunity to invite people and, and say if you do have some comments or some concerns about how these policies are being crafted or being applied you can bring it up to Nina or myself because you're also handling equity for this tournament so mm-hmm. yeah that's it for this episode thank you so much again Mary for a great thank you too I had fun yeah thank you so we had fun in the interview as well like we learned a lot truly um so that's it again we'll see you in the next round bye bye